Foster Cave is on Power Twenty. Strength for the powerless, courage for the fearful, hope and healing for wounded hearts. Hello and welcome back to Foster Care, an unparalleled journey with Jason and Amanda. And today we have Brian Post with us. Brian, I found through the Post Institute on Facebook, Brian popped up one day and I found a live and I was like, dang, this dude's like, this dude's spitting truth over here. I'm honored to be here, Jason and Amanda. Glad, glad you guys had me on. I did not know there was many people out there talking about this stuff. From what I've understood, you seem to have an experiential knowledge base. Like I heard you talk about, you know, working with group homes and working with kids and families every day. So tell me, what is it that you do and how are you involved in this, in this situation and how did you get there? Like what led you into that? Man, I've been in this game for over 20 years now. And to be honest with you, I started, I started working with families in their homes and I still work with families in their homes. It's today is Sunday and I'll see two families today. I've got two kids with me right now. So everything that I'm about, I'm about experience and I'm about taking complex science and making it really simple and applicable so we can see it in every day and every moment. And so that we can develop a greater awareness, a greater consciousness so that we can live more mindfully and more present and help create stronger, more loving relationships. And so that's been my whole career. I'm thankful for the 90s, the decade of the brain, because I was just coming out of graduate school during that time and just starting to get my earliest experiences and working with families. And then when I got when I got introduced to some of those gangsters of the brain, um, it really just it just propelled my learning and my, my education from a from a whole different angle. It was it was like taking taking what I was learning in these books by Alan Shore and these lectures by Bruce Perry and Joseph Ledeau and combining it with what I was seeing with families. And this is after always already having spent several years with some leading um, clinicians in the field at that time. And so it just really, you know, my big thing is I, I've always had problems with authority because I was adopted. I was in foster care for a short period of time. I grew up in a home with a lot of conflict and I uh, watched a sister, adopted sister. She struggled with my parents mightily throughout her life. And um, it just, it all has just kind of culminated. People ask me, you know, how I got started doing what I do. And I just tell them, this is what God created me to do. Everything I've ever, everything I've ever experienced, everything I've ever gone through, it has molded me to be able to, to see these families in a different way. And it all started with seeing myself in a different way. I was 27 years old before I realized I was scared. I was 27 years old before I realized that I was stressed and that I was sensitive and that I had experienced trauma. And I was already, I had already had an agency at that time. I had a, a, an outpatient intensive, intensive in-home agency seeing, seeing um, low-income families. I'd worked in juvenile probation. And um, it wasn't until I was 27 years old, two, three years in, that I realized that it's what I bring to the table that changes all the dynamics. And that's kind of what I show up with now. It's my, my whole mission and goal is to help parents develop a deeper understanding of themselves so they can then develop a deeper understanding of their children so that they can then educate their children and grow their children up having a deeper understanding of themselves so that we all get to grow mindfully. How have you learned to walk through, through that with your own? Because it sounds like you had your own level of trauma, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. So how have you learned to walk through your own traumas in those moments when it's really hard to do it? Well, it, it starts, I say this so often, it's, it's, it's like people usually hear it and they're like, oh, gosh, there's got to be, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. But it really isn't. It really comes down in any given moment to your ability to stop and breathe. Because when you stop and breathe, you're actually reducing the anxiety of your amygdala. So in the in the midst of stress, and that's what's, you know, when your kids are acting out, your amygdala is moving you into defense. 
That's and that's all that the amygdala does. The amygdala is protective. It's always moving us into defense. And then it forms these pathways based on our experiences that are always moving us into defense. And so when you become stressed and you move into defense, the first thing you stop doing is you stop breathing. You start holding your breath. And when you're holding your breath, you are literally taking on a more defensive cellular posture. And when you're taking on a defensive cellular posture, what you're actually doing is you're releasing a negative vibration. You're releasing a vibration of, of anxiety and fear and stress. And so when we can teach ourselves to breathe in every possible given moment, it helps lower that anxiety. And as long as we keep that anxiety di dialed down, we have a greater, Joseph Ledeau says, in times of stress, our thinking becomes confused and distorted and our short-term memory is suppressed. Joseph Ledeau has a great uh, interview with Joe Rogan. So I really, you know, I don't, haven't gotten to see many good interviews with him, but um, he wrote a book called The Emotional Brain. He's a New York University neuroscientist. He says, in times of stress, our thinking becomes confused and distorted and our short-term memory is suppressed. So when the amygdala starts to activate and that anxiety dials up, we stop thinking clearly and we forget. We don't remember. And so when you can teach yourself to breathe, and Herbert Benson discovered this in the 1970s with the relaxation response, which was actually based on Eastern, Eastern meditation, transcendental meditation, science and philosophy and beliefs, when you can, but he, because he was a Harvard physiologist, it's like all of a sudden it's this thing that we call the relaxation response, but now the Buddha's been doing this a long time. When you can breathe, you can stay present. And when you can stay present, you change the vibration that you send off to the, to the other person's brain, because that's all we do. Our brains just communicate and share vibration patterns. Wow. It's almost like some of the stuff that, that people have said for, for years is, got real science that, that stands behind it and and we didn't need the science because it works right the, the yeah, monks yeah. have taught us about that yeah we, we've always known it's just that science the, the decade of the brain really just helps confirm it and affirm it okay it sounds to me like you're probably about five years older than i am maybe so i'm gonna guess that you probably were raised with people who had similar mentalities to the way i was raised oh shit sure. yeah if you misbehave you know a spanking is the answer Oh, I got whipped. Uh, I don't know if you have you ever done the switch dance. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, my my dad was no joke. He was a heavy he was a heavy equipment operator in a rock quarry, and he grew up one of the oldest of nine kids, and they didn't jack around. His dad was an alcoholic who died early, got shot in a bar. His mom had to work. They were kind of sharecroppers. Then he was on top of that, he was a Vietnam veteran with severe post traumatic stress disorder. He did not play. He did not play, which is interesting because then I have my sister and my mom always says, and I have these two pictures, one of me as an infant and one as my sister as an infant. The picture of me as an infant, I mean, I literally look like I'm drunk with happiness. I mean, I look like a little drunk love baby. And I always knew as I got deeper into this work that I had a really good in utero experience. And a lot of times people don't realize just how much of who we are started after conception, right after conception. We, so much of who we are is rooted in those early days and weeks and months after we are conceived. And then my sister right next to this picture has these big eyes, her fists are clenched and she looks terrified. And my mom always says, when we got you, you were smiling and when we got your sister, she was crying. And so people don't realize that, that those early experiences define us and create our blueprints. John Bowlby said the first, the first three years of our lives create the blueprints for all of our future relationships. After the decade of the brain, we know that that's from conception to about age five creates those blueprints for who we are. And we have to really learn how to navigate through those blueprints but I say all that because to go back to the fact that my dad was not, you know, he, he was a serious, easily stressed out, overwhelmed man. And it's so interesting because I grew up in a home and it, 
you know, <laughs> there's so much BS in mental health. There's so much BS. It, it's, it, it makes me nauseous. There's so much BS in the ways we deal with children and we try to, we try to validate it and justify it based on what I'm not sure because brain science certainly doesn't back it up. And it's almost like people should not be allowed to continue to advocate and to teach things to do towards children if they can't back it up with brain science because it's now just so obvious. But my dad, we'd be driving in a car, we had a big old white Impala, two door white Impala. And you know, that was in the day when there was no seat belts. So starting off on a trip, we'd all, me and my sister would be up on that back seat, right? And we, on the front seat, we'd be talking, you know, jibber jabbering, anxious little kids, excited, whatever. And my parents would leave us up there for a little bit. And I know it was because it was till my dad's window of tolerance started to get too small. And eventually we'd be up there like this, you know, getting all this and all what they're talking about and everything. And then he'd say, sit back. It didn't take me long to realize when my dad said, sit back, I needed to sit back. But because of my early in utero experience, it helped me to have a little stronger regulatory capacity than my sister. My sister was premature. She was alcohol exposed. She was in an incubator for the first three months of her life. She weighed three pounds. So she, her regulatory capacity for stress and anxiety was different than mine. So I would learn because I was a little more regulated. I could think, I could remember, I would sit back. She might sit back for two seconds and then she'd be right back on that, on that seat, you know, right back in their business. And she was such an anxious child. She was always talking just nonsensical, you know, they call that nonsensical chatter. But what it is, is it's really anxiety and insecurity. And so she'd be back on that back seat. My dad would say, I said, sit back. I knew a train wreck was coming at that point. Yeah, when he does, when the, when the voice increased a couple of octaves and he says, I said, sit back. You knew it was, you knew what was gonna happen. And this didn't happen just once. She would sit back for about five seconds and she'd be right back on the back of that seat. And I would just be back there shaking my head and he didn't give another warning. His hand would come. And like I said, he drove a, he drove a big old uh, front end loader. He used to take down these mountains in this rock quarry and he was not a little man, but his hands would come from that steering wheel, that one hand and he'd go, bam! And he would smack her, backhand her right in the face and knock her into that seat. And she would just be crying. And all I could do is just shake my head, man, because it happened not once, not twice, not three, four, five times. That tells you. And any, any parent's little bullshit consequences and little points and rewards and little threats and little ground and little shaming, if a child cannot learn from getting knocked, getting the hell knocked out of them right in their mouth with knuckles by a grown ass man knocked into the back of a seat, if a child cannot learn from that, they're not going to learn from any of that other crap. And the reason they can't learn is because they are stressed out and their memory system is turned off. And when we use all those other techniques, they don't work because the child's stressed and their memory system's turned off. So that's my experience from as far back as I can remember. So I don't come to this field with any bullshit illusions of what works with children and what doesn't. I mean, this is my, this is my life. It's been my whole life. So how do you turn that memory system back on? You got to help the child regulate. You have to regulate yourself as an adult. You have to regulate yourself first. My, the brain is, is historical and it is always learning. But if you didn't get it, you don't have it and you got to get it. And the only way a child can get it is through the teaching and the modeling of the parent. If my dad could not dial down his anxiety, he could not help my sister dial down her anxiety. Therefore, he couldn't help her brain learn a new neural pathway. If you can't, through enough repetition, help the brain learn a new neural pathway, that child's not going to change because you're not changing as an adult. See, we think these children 
need to change because they have these behavior problems. But what we don't realize is that these children's behaviors are byproducts of their neural pathways. It's conditioned negative neural pathways from a brain that is rooted in survival. And so they come into our lives and they cause us anxiety and stress because they tap into our old pathways, our old survival pathways. So we get locked into these two dynamics. One's a surviving dynamic and one's a thriving dynamic. When you start to experience more surviving than you do thriving, you're not helping that child's, that child's brain change. So what happens is children just grow older they don't grow better. And that happens over and over and over and over again. And unfortunately, it doesn't have to because the brain is so amazing. It changes really quick. I can take a child who's been in high levels of anxiety, take a family that's been in high levels of anxiety, help the family start to develop just some different ways of understanding, some different emotional understanding and awareness. And all of a sudden that anxiety just drops down. And then they start to try to work through and create more healing and more repetition. That's amazing because, you know, we, like I mentioned before, we all come to the situation with our own bucket of anxieties, you know, and one of the things I've learned about marriages is you take two buckets of anxiety and you try and put them into one bucket and suddenly you have a mess, right? And you start adding kids and trauma on top of that. And that, that mess goes everywhere. And most of us don't even I think recognize our own traumas. Yeah, we, we don't, we don't, we don't, because we don't, we don't know what trauma is. We don't realize that trauma is any stressful event, which is prolonged, overwhelming, or unpredictable. And when that event continues on without our ability to express it, without our ability to process it, and without our ability to understand it, it's the difference between a short-term stressful experience and a long-term, potentially life-altering, potentially brain-altering traumatic experience. Stressful experiences that we don't get to talk about and cry about and feel about and understand become traumatic events. And that's why we don't know what trauma is because most of us grow up in environments of trauma. And what the most pervasive form of trauma in our society, the two most pervasive forms of trauma in our society are emotional absence and parental depression. And the reason you don't understand that you're that you that you experience trauma is because you grew up in a household where there was food, where there was parents present and there was no beating and there was no abuse and they worked hard and there was a few laughs. But what you don't realize is that your parents were emotionally absent. They were not emotionally connected. What you don't realize is that you probably had a parent who was parentally depressed. Now, what's important about those two things specifically, Tiffany Fields, a researcher at the University of Miami, did a study with infants. She took two infants. She had one infant who was who she hooked she hooked both infants up to brain scans. She had one infant with a healthy parent and another infant with a depressed parent. The brain scans looked exactly the same when the healthy parent got up and walked away from her baby compared to when the depressed parent walked towards her baby. Oh, wow. So imagine if every time your parent walks towards you you feel stressed. It's confusing to the brain. Every time your parent walks towards you, you're supposed to feel a little excited. You're supposed to feel a sense of ease. You're supposed to experience an oxytocin release. Oxytocin is your brain's anti-stress hormone. It's a learned hormone in the brain. But imagine if every time your parent walked towards you, your brain signaled threat or danger. Well, that's what most of our brains grow up experiencing. Even though we have all of these basic comforts and accommodations, most of us grow up in these environments where our parents were not there because they're working, because they're stressed out, because they have their own history, because they have their own challenges. And they think that that just providing love and support and comfort is what's what we need, which it is. But that love, love is, is a verb, it's action. Love is about an action. And when your parents are whipping you and saying, I'm whipping you because I love you, that's the problem. We have grown up with fear disguised as love. We don't realize that most of our interactions with our children create more stress than they do love because that's our conditioning. We've been misconditioned to believe that what we're doing with our children is actually love when it's not. 
so much of what we end up doing with our children is about our own feeling of survival because of our own amygdala and it has nothing to do with our children at all love is allowing you to be patient it's allowing you to be mindful it's allowing you to be calm it's allowing you to slow down and it's allowing you to create an environment and maintain a relationship where your child can become all that god wants your child to be that's what love's about love is not so much about molding your child love is not so much about punishing your child because they do something bad that see that's all fear-based but that's our condition that's the way society sees children and that's why you encounter so many groups on on facebook where there are bitter and resentful and hostile and angry parents who've had nasty adoption and foster care experiences because they were they were sold a bill of goods for how life with a child is supposed to be i hear you on that that love is a verb thing this is something i've been uh, i've been trying to preach for years i think we've been sold a bill of goods by disney that love means that we were meant to be and we'll find the perfect answer and it will just fall in our lap and everything will always be awesome and we won't ever have to do anything because I'll find my Prince Charming, he'll find his princess and we'll live happily ever after. And that's what real love is, isn't it? Well, it's Walt Disney's fault, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but for decades, we've been sold this bill of goods and the parents have not taken the time to, to like point out the fact that love is a, really is a verb. I, I love that. I, I didn't know the first place I heard that, but I heard that years ago and went, wow, that that's that's actually kind of deep love is not what you do to someone it's what you do for them and learning how to do that for other people is is a is a real skill set and doing it for a kid who needs it in a moment when you don't feel like it and sometimes sometimes it's it, the the thing that we need to do for them is just be present you see that's that's the hardest thing the hardest thing Amanda said, well, how, how do you help? How do you help the child? The most difficult thing for us is to just be present. We don't have to give advice. We don't have to dole out punishment. We don't have to dole out our judgments. We have to learn to be present and we have to learn to be supportive. We have to learn to be encouraging. That is enough because when we can get to a place that our brain can allow us to do that, our child's brain can change. It doesn't have to get a lot more complicated than that. And I'm telling you, this is this is over 20 years experience of working with every level of child, probably a hundred times. Every diagnosis, every medication, I've seen it all. I've worked with it all. I've, it's just like ad nauseum. I had a dad the other day, oh, you've never seen a child like this one. Oh my God, give me a gun right now. I've seen it all. I've seen it all and seen stuff worse than anyone wants to imagine. And so what we have to realize, and this is kind of my, my whole platform, is that children's, children's behaviors arise from a place of stress. Bottom line, both of our children and adults our negative behaviors arise from a state of stress. Our positive behaviors arise from a state of stress. In between the behavior and the stress is the presence of a primary emotion. And there are only two, love and fear. It's through the expression, the processing, and the understanding of the fear that we can calm the stress and diminish the behavior. It's not about the behavior. It's not about the behavior. It's not about the behavior. It's about the stress and the fear. The stress and the fear are the roots. The behavior is the tip of the iceberg. The stress and the fear is the root. The first part, the first part of that model, which is called the stress model, is that we have to, in the face of stress, the first thing we have to do is we have to stop and breathe and dial down our own fear so we can move into a space of love. And then we contend with our children's stress and fear. One of my older sons, he's uh, 19 now. We, we had a, a discussion a while back and, and it turned into a little bit of a debate for a moment because he thought it was crazy, but it, it kind of lines up with what you're talking about. I said, you know, man, all these people that I meet, all these things I see, and I said, you know, I see so many people whose behavior is rooted in fear. I didn't understand it until I got a little bit older, how even, like you said, positive behavior can sometimes be rooted in fear. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid something good won't happen if I'm, if I don't behave this way. Yeah, that's right. You know, and, and I don't be a little bit selfish here because I really would like to hear what you have to say on this. You mentioned about being emotionally unavailable, right? Mm -hmm. 
I've met a lot of guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a dad's group, and we talk pretty deeply in there. And I've met a lot of guys who who kind of struggle with the same thing. Yeah. So how do you reconnect with those emotions so that you can learn to deal with them? Because if I don't know how to deal with them and I can't model them for my kids. And so they're going to sit in that same place or they're going to feel the emotions and just not have anybody to show them how to deal with them. And now I'm just going to deal with behaviors instead of helping them deal with the emotion. So what we, what we don't realize is that relationship, every aspect of this, this episode based on everything that you and Amanda do and everything that I do, it's all rooted in emotion. We, we think it is the, like we can approach it from a logical place, but it's actually rooted in emotion. So because we are emotional because we're nothing more than vibration. So every interaction you have is really it, it literally is emotional, but your brain has learned through early conditioning to try to override it. But the reality is, is that our brains are dictated to by our emotional brain. Your left hemisphere is dictated to you by your right hemisphere. But over time, what happens is that when the emotional brain is ignored and denied and suppressed, the left hemisphere, the thinking brain, becomes more preemptive and more, more dominant. But we don't realize it's still controlled by the emotional brain. And so in order to connect or reconnect, and I don't even say you have to reconnect, it's there. You've got to slow down and let it rise up. The problem is it is the emotion has been suppressed to the bottom of the ocean. So you go down, you, you dive in and you swim down and it starts to get kind of dark and kind of cold and you swim back up before you let it really come up. And, and then you, you override it with your thinking. What you've got to do is you've got to slow down in any given moment and you've got to ask yourself, and this is this is the practice of mindfulness. You've got to slow down and breathe and ask yourself, what am I feeling in this moment? Because you're always feeling something. You just may not know it until you ask the question and spend the time to get in touch with it. And then you honor that emotion. You honor that emotion for yourself. So see, parents have to be able to do this Parents have to be able to do this, you know, from moment to moment with their children in order to stay present. So I'm driving in a car with my, I could have two, three kids with me. The I'm not focused on the kids. I'm focused on myself. I'm focused on my own breath. I'm focused on my own thoughts. I'm focused on my own awareness because that's how I keep myself dialed down so I can engage in any given moment to whatever may show up. It's like keeping the brain a blank, a blank slate, but you only do that by being able to monitor your emotions. So it is a, it's, it's a re repetitive process. It's a process of conditioning. Just slowing down, even in this moment, you take a deep breath, Breathe into your chest and you just ask yourself, what am I feeling right now? What am I feeling? Is it anxiety? Is it sadness? Is it grief? Which then builds into more sadness. And then it's just right there. You just stay right there with that. You see, a lot of times what we want to do is we want to run, we want to run away with it. We want to talk through it. We don't want to stay with it. Yeah, you're talking about me pretty deep there. You know, yeah. it's, it's funny you mentioned that because um, I had gotten into a mindfulness practice for a while, really structured about it every morning. I would I had an alarm set. I get up early in the morning. I get up for work at 2 a.m. It's one of the few quiet times in my house. I have six kids in my house today. <laughs> and then we have another little guy that comes over and hangs out, um, a godson who comes over in the afternoon a couple days a week. My house is not a quiet place, right? He is an infant, and I have him all the way up, all the developmental ages. I have a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a six-year-old. I have a 13 and an almost 15-year-old. I have a 19-year-old. So, like, you can only imagine all the, all the things, the noises during the day. So the morning is the only time I get that quiet place. I would spend that time intentionally and it was funny that amanda would look at me some days and say did you do your your meditation this morning <laughs> like no <laughs> why <laughs> but, you can tell yeah she could she could see that coming out in me in ways yeah. 
that that I, I've learned to to uh, you know I, I take that time at different points in the day now to really try and, and sit through that you know but but we sit through so many of those moments that there's so many emotional moments in our house that it can be overwhelming pretty quickly if you're not careful and if you don't you don't have that experience to be able to to lead your kids in that way and yeah. now it's I have I have one little guy in. He was he was born he was drug expo- exposed in utero. Um, he spent his first what, 11, days. eleven days in a hospital on a methadone wean down. And um, so when he when he came home from the hospital, he stayed with a family member for one night. And they were like, "Well, can't do this." You know, I mean, you can only if you've ever seen somebody on meth trying to trying to come off of it. That's hard. Imagine a newborn at a day old. That it was tough. And, and so he came to our house, and and I have some skill sets that make me uniquely qualified to deal with that. And um, our daughter was in the hospital real sick at the time. So Amanda and, and our oldest son was spending most of the time there. So guess who had the drug addicted baby to take care of? Yeah. And just being in that moment with him, it's amazing that, that even now we, we have a connection there because I would sit quietly with him so much. Um, I now spend time. Uh, we just found a, a sensory sleep sock, I think they called it, for them to, um, for them to be able to, to, to try that out and see if that helps him sleep. And I found that if I can get him to lay down in a sensory sleep sock and he'll lay down, I taught him to fold his little hands and he was, he was teaching mommy how to do this the other day. He'll fold his hands and lace his fingers, put them across your belly, you know, take a big breath. And I, I'm trying to teach him belly breathing. So breathe so that it moves your hands up and big deep breath and then let it out slow because this kid runs 180 miles an hour all day. And trying to get him to sleep is a challenge. So I, I start this, let it out real slow. And, and he does this practice. And I would sit with him in that moment and just be present as we would do this together. It was amazing to watch it fall asleep. Because yeah. this is the kid who can lay in bed until 1130 at night. And he'll be out of bed a dozen times. And, and there'll be a hole in the wall. And he's not hitting it. Yeah. He's only four or five years old. He's We've got an old house. It's built in 1900 something, right? It's got the old plaster and lath walls. There'll be one little spot and he'll start picking it. He'll pick a yeah. hole in the dang wall just because he's bored and wild and all that. And, and to watch him do this and calm himself down. Yeah. It's amazing to see how that mindfulness practice not only helped me in ways that, that Amanda could see, but like I can watch it in him. And he's he's five years old today. And to watch him do this. And putting himself right to sleep is just amazing that all this power is not from this cool new drug. Yeah. You know, or seven different drugs at once that, that finally work together. Yeah. The power of breathing. It's breath. It's mindfulness. <clears throat> it's the that, power of presence. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. It's you being there with them. Any, anybody can swallow a pill. Yeah. If you're alone. Well, and that, that presence is allowing you to turn on his oxytocin response. And when you can keep the anxiety dialed down and you can turn the oxytocin up, then you are training his own oxytocin response. And that oxytocin response is eventually what helps him be able to regulate his anxiety. You see, a lot of these kids, because of their early experiences, they have more cortisol than they do oxytocin. So they're not able to calm. And then over a period of time, the the cortisol becomes stronger. So the anxiety is higher. And the the calm, the oxytocin gets washed away. So they end up finding, they end up finding their soothing from exhaustion, not from true calm. So presence enables us to always be turning on someone else's oxytocin response. They get anxious, their anxiety dials up, and that could come out through cursing, it could come out through loud voice, it could come out through hyperactivity, it could come out through you know hitting 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 something. When we dial our, our, our anxiety and our cortisol down, we turn our oxytocin up, and that starts to turn their oxytocin up. And as their oxytocin starts to turn up a little higher and a little higher, their anxiety goes down. You know, it's amazing that there's science behind all this. Just just the other night, you know, the little dude we've got who stays with us, right? Uh, on, on the evenings, every every now and then we watch a baby for him. And, um, and the kids were, the two youngest were, I mean, they were wild. They were ready to, to just blow the roof off the house. I'm like, no, guys, it's bedtime. I got this little dude who's crying. And, and so I took him, I took them upstairs to their bedroom and laid each one down. And I sat down and with the door open between the rooms so that they can both hear. And because a little girl we got staying with us right now, she's she's kind of in, in that same headspace. You know, I, I don't know her whole story, but I know just by watching that, that she has some of that high anxiety in her. 
Yeah. And so I sat down with my little dude, you know, Frankie, and I'm sitting there talking with him and doing the breathing exercise. And I've got the infant sitting in front of me and he's, you know, he's crying off and on because that's what, what infants do. And, and, you know, calming down and all that as we go through that. And this kid falls asleep beside me. And I'm like, this is amazing. So I picked the little guy up and, and carry him into the other room. And I walk in there and because I'm not a singer, don't, ask, don't don't tell my kids that they don't know it yet they'll figure it out soon enough but because i grew up in that church you know old fundamentalist church what we sing we sing old hymns right i've, I've got a lot of old hymns in my heart so so i'm walking around carrying a baby and i got this little girl who is just still high in her anxiety and i'm just walking in circles in the bedroom carrying a baby singing old school church hymns to these kids who they've never heard before and it was amazing to watch her do the same thing and watch her just calm down and and I don't know how much of like the, the mirroring she was getting as I was with him, you know, being loud with it and taking care of that, you know, being real loud with the breath so that hopefully she could hear me and would, would try and mirror some of that herself. But then I walked in there and it wasn't maybe 10 minutes in each room. And I ended up with those two asleep and the baby who it's time to eat. And I know he was getting ready to be hungry. He felt he dozes off in the middle of it all too. I'm like, holy cow, look at all this. There's so much of this that, that 10 years ago, I would have been so lost in figuring out how to handle it. Yeah. But we didn't we didn't walk into most of this with, with with head knowledge, right? We had to learn it through experiential stuff. We had to like stumble our through our through it ourselves and screw it all up. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think the important piece for, for people to take away here is that that yes, you can do it. You were built with the things to do it, and you don't need a PhD in anything. Sometimes you just need to screw up enough to figure out how to do it right. We, we all do, even the PhD. The PhD usually has to screw up even more because they have so much head knowledge that won't allow them to get to their heart. Yeah, and I think that, that experiential stuff is, is part of what's really made this so very important to me. Yeah, and you know, one of, the, one of the things you said, Jason, is that you were breathing, hoping that your, your child might see you and, and mimic that. Alan Shore says the core of the self is nonverbal and unconscious in lies and patterns of affect regulation. And I just reframe that to say that it's not what we say or do, it's how we feel when we're doing and saying it. So just your singing and just your breathing and just the slow motion that you are taking is actually creating a different vibration. That vibration is what's changing the environment. So that's where mirror neurons come in place because the, the, the neurons are electrical or electrical units. They're not, you know, something that's looking at you. It's something that's being experienced. So as your energy and vibration is changing, your child's energy and vibration changes. Everyone's relaxing and you don't have to say anything at all. You just have to feel in the right space and the right energy. You know, you mentioned all that. It reminds me, we've had a couple different people come on our podcast and talk about equine therapy Mm -hmm. and how much that's exactly the same story of what's going on when you work with horses. Yeah. And we're we're in kind of rural Missouri. We're in town up here. And if I go over here, there's a little road that goes down and dead ends into a place where a gal has a barn and a couple horses. And my wife and daughter went down there and this this white horse, Snowball, she's named her, always walks up to the fence and wants her to pet her. And And so my wife and and daughter went down there one day and the owner was out. The owner says, oh, these are all rescue horses. She's like, just be careful with that one. The white one, she is mean. She will hurt you in a heartbeat. And my daughter's like, no, she won't. I can't get her come to me. And she's like, she walks over to me all the time. And it's it's interesting. I walked down there with them recently and and went down because I know a few people who talked about that a lot. I have a couple people I know who work with horses a lot. Just understanding that nonverbal side of it. And to walk up and I had the kids down there and to, you know, shoulders down, head down calm breathing and watch yeah. how they behave and then get a little bit animated a little bit excited move my hands a little bit face them shoulders on feet square to them and see the reaction i'm like this is what you do every day dude you don't yeah. know this a bit like you have the same reaction she's just this horse has been abused so she's more obvious in her reaction you know she'll turn around and give me, give me the hind end real fast because it's not because she's trying to ignore me she's paying close attention those hooves can hurt me she's yeah. threatening me right now you know, mm-hmm. and kind of just watch and teaching the kids how to how to walk up and be calm, mm-hmm. and take a potentially dangerous situation and create this calm mode, this room where they can just walk up and pet this horse. And the lady was blown away that she could just walk up and pet this horse. 
and, I, and it's it's a the power is there it's it's the same thing we do with our kids it's the yeah. same thing we do at work with the people we work around i mean i deal with the public some in my work and i'm gonna tell you that the public as a whole it's a challenging thing to deal with some days <laughs> <laughs> and some days i just put on my hate me face you know it, it, I, I can i can do that and keep a space around me pretty easy yeah, I mean, I'm I'm standing around places with with large quantities of explosives and stuff, and so people, if I make a hate me face, people tend to stay away. But it's all about that vibration that you're putting out in the world around you, and being conscious of it, yeah. and understanding the con that you have that in you, and understanding how to control it. Where did you first learn to, to that? Number one, that was something you were doing that you didn't even know before you you realized you were, and number two, how to control that and to get the responses from people that's beneficial that you're looking for from the people around you, especially with kids. You know, I feel like I, I just, um, I probably at, at some level, it's always just been a part of who I am. Um, I had an experience early with my, with my oldest daughter when she was uh, going through potty training. I, and I, I just, I, I knew then it's like, I wanted to do different than how my parents had done me. And so I wanted to parent her different. And so I knew I just had to do something different. You know, it's like, just do something different. It doesn't, you, know, you don't always know. This is in my early 20s. You don't always know what to do. You just do something different. And then when I really had the awareness of my own fear, uh, later into my young adulthood when I was 27, that really changed everything. When I when I became intimately aware of how scared I had always been and how sensitive to stress I had always been, that really changed ain't changed everything for me. It, it literally changed everything. Yeah, I can see that with changing everything for you when you can finally realize it. Unfortunately, I think most of us wait way too long in life before we start to realize those things. It gets a little more challenging. Yeah, I I trained a guy a while back at my job and. And he's a younger dude, right? And and I remember sitting and, and thinking, first thought is like, my gosh, yeah. 20, you know, young 20 year old dudes, they're just not so bright. And then, then the next day I'm training, I'm thinking, dang it, he reminds me of me at that age. Yeah. That's what's driving me crazy. <laughs> exactly. And I remember who I was at that age. I'm like, yeah, that guy wasn't very bright. I know him real well. He, he did all kinds of stupid stuff. And it wasn't until I got older that I started realizing it. And for the challenge for us is I was a young dude who didn't have a clue. I mean, I, I can say I had a good heart, but I didn't have a clue what to do that wouldn't cause damage. And I've told this to my oldest son. He's he, he since gone off to the military and he, he became a, a nurse through the military and, and gotten out. And, and we've talked. I said, dude, you were like a science experiment gone wrong. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was like giving a 12 year old a beaker and some acid and some other things and just see what happens I mean yeah. they, they didn't send you home with an instruction manual or nothing I didn't know what I was doing I was a dummy Yeah. and, and now with, with the two kids we have who are in the middle um, the, the, our teenagers who are young teens right now and I'm like okay yeah I can, I can kind of figure this out better and, and I didn't do the early childhood nearly as well as I should have but as I have the youngest kids because we have that many right I'm like Okay, I, I can do this right now. I can start out right. How do you how do you speak into the lives of of a young family who think they're doing everything right, but but have some things that would really make a big difference and get to that part in their heart where you go, oh man, just listen to this, man. That's like I screwed this up, and here's how you can not screw it up. Well, sometimes you have you have to work through their guilt and through their shame. And a lot of times it's our guilt and our shame that gets in the way of us really getting honest. And so just very gently helping them start to just consider that they're seeing something different than what they think. I had a dad not long ago, we were, we were just sitting in their living room having a conversation, my first meeting with this mom and their dad, and they're young, they're a young couple. And um, I basically just laid out that they laid out for them that they had both experienced significant trauma in adolescence. And man, dad just, he, I call it stoving up. He stoved up, 
And he was, he was so emotional in his face. And I just slowed way down and I lowered my voice and I said, dad, what's going on right now? And he was just, he was like a, like a, just like a pent up 13 year old. And he just, tears started streaming down his face. And he said, I didn't know I had experienced trauma. And I don't, I don't want to talk about it. It's over, it's in the, it's in the past. And I just let him sit with that. And I just said, but dad, it's not, it's right here, right now. It's still right here. And he just, you know, just allowing him to relax into that without feeling overwhelmed about it, that it just is what it is. And they have a 14 year old that they're really going through it with right now that's stirring up all of that adolescent trauma and anxiety. And about a week later, he texted me and he said, man, I just saw a great example of what you were, what you were teaching us. And he's talking about his, his family members, five-year-old and a, and, a, and a little dynamic. And so just sometimes it's just planting seeds for people to be able to consider that there's something different than what they've experienced. And Stephen Covey called that a different paradigm. Uh, you know, seeing seeing a different paradigm. And I, I tell people they have to learn to see through a different lens than what they've grown up with. It's funny you mentioned that. Um, when I see things three times in, in rapid succession in my life, it, for whatever reason, I pay attention to that. You're the third person in the last probably two, two, three days that has encouraged the idea of planting seeds in people's lives to me. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, whether you want to call it God or the universe, there's something, when, when something comes up three times in quick succession like that, I know it's time to, for me to pay attention. Yeah. The idea <laughs> of planting seeds instead of fixing problems. Yeah. You can't, you can't fix people's problems. I love that. I love that. So you, you, you've talked a couple of times about working with families. Do you, do you work with families on your own? Is that, is that like a service that you offer or, or how does that? So we have, um, well, I have a, a wraparound, it's, it's a parents in training. It's a wraparound agency in Northern California where we serve adoptive families and uh, they're at risk adoptive families. And we go, we go in and provide a number of services to help them maintain the placement and, um, you know, try to try to create an opportunity for some hope and some healing for these kids and for these parents. So that's my, that's my, uh, full-time gig and it's usually about seven days a week and then we have post institute where we provide education and then there's uh, our facebook post institute page where i do the daily dose five days a week <laughs> you sound like me i do this like seven days a week and then five days a week and you sound you're trying to get like 14 days in your week ain't you yeah. <laughs> busy busy that's right but you know here's the important part about that is that you know the post institute stuff on on the facebook lives and things that i've heard there that's where i where i managed to, to find you you know i you said you're in northern california right yes mm -hmm. and we would not have run across each other any other way because i mean we're, we're located in mid missouri mm -hmm. i was stationed in uh monterey bay for for a hot minute years ago so that's about all my experience of california as i can tell you that right off post down there right off uh, of uh the, the Presidio at Monterey is a cool place down there called Companios, and he would make you one heck of a sandwich. And that's <laughs> well, less what I remember California. <laughs> and so, yeah, we, we probably wouldn't have met. And it sounds like you've got a message to hand out to the world. Where can people find you online? Because, I mean, other than obviously the, the Facebook uh, group and, the, and the, the lives and stuff, um, where can people find you to, to talk to you and learn from your message? Because it's valuable. And that's that's really it. I have, we do have a uh, I have a book. My one of my best sellers is called From Fear to Love, and uh, we have a little website set up where we ship people the book for free. It's called feartolovebook.com, and uh, if they pay the shipping and handling. We we send them, we mail them a physical copy of the book. We give them a audio, the audio version of the book, and we also give them a one hour webinar that I did for adoptive moms. Um, and that's all for, I think, $6.95. So that's, you know, that's a great little introductory offer. But otherwise, yeah, on, on the, our Post Institute Facebook page where I do Daily Dose, there are probably 450 
50 videos that I've done over the last almost two years. And so there's some all day lectures on there. You know, there's some five minute talks and they, they can get as much Brian post as they want. Okay. So we're, we're uh, it, it, all the information is out there. Yeah. And, and I'm thankful for it because, you know, our, our kids all come from a place of trauma. Yeah. My wife and I both come from a place of trauma and learning how to deal with that in a way that's beneficial for us and them, you know, because I mean, so many, what's the, the divorce rate last I heard was somewhere hovering just north of 50%. Yeah. Right. And, and so you're raising these kids, whether it's foster, whether it's adoptive, whether it's even biological kids, because I'll tell you, because I don't think my kids listen to my podcast. So I'll tell you, even my biological kids have caused me some drama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, raising, parenting is not easy. No, it's not for the weak. Nope. And so, you know, but, but any parent needs stuff like this to be able to walk through because if we do it right, our end goal someday, and it's going to be a while yet, but someday is to have this house with grandbabies showing up now and then. But at the end of the day, it's just going to show it be me and her. Yeah. I tell people all the time, this, this is not, this is, it feels like you're doing it for your child now and you're doing it for your family now, but really it's not. This is for your grandchildren and your great grandchildren because we are changing the lineage of families. And so we're changing the generations, the chains that you have the ability to break the chains right now in this generation and send something different forward. And that's, that's what I want for families because that's how we change the world. I was in uh, talking with some friends here a while back and uh, well in the dad's group I'm in. And one of the things we talked about a lot was, um, was heritage was, was legacy. And that was, that was the, the thing that I realized that we have a legacy, good or bad, you're going to leave it. That's right. And, and in foster care, we see a lot of those, you know, kids who, who are now parents with their kids in the system. Yeah. And this is our opportunity to break those generational change. 100%. Thank you guys for having me on. No, it's it's been awesome. You know, Jason showed me some of your stuff and I was like, wow. You know, it was just very eye-opening because who doesn't want to do better for their children? Absolutely. You got to be better for yourself first. Absolutely. So thank you so much for all your time today. Yeah, because what you're what you're doing with with what you're doing online, you're changing you're changing the hearts and minds of parents, which will change kids and grandkids and quite frankly, those kids and grandkids are the one going to be making decisions about our health care and right. our lives when we can't do it anymore. We, we got to make sure they do better. And, and you're leading that in a positive way. So we really appreciate that. All right. You guys take care. You too. Uh-huh. A huge thank you to Brian Post for coming on here and sharing all of his wisdom and experience and hard fought knowledge with us today for free. Check down in the show notes to find ways to contact him. Look up the post Institute on Facebook and sign up for his information. And we will put links to all of his stuff down in the show notes so you can find him. You'll also find our links as well down there. Now, one quick warning. If you're on an Apple device, sometimes Apple podcast and iTunes, The links don't work. It's a little bit wonky, and I cannot seem to figure it out. So until then, just go on over to fostercarenation.com. Look at the show notes tab, and you will find a picture of him and his show. Click on that, and it'll all be listed in there for sure. Now, if you guys would like to support us in any way, we would love it. Take this episode and share it with your friends. Share it with people who you think might be interested. Share it with people who could use the information. Just share this around and let people know that there's help out there for kids who've been through hard things that we just don't know how to handle. Now, if you have a couple extra dollars and you'd like to help us out and support us monetarily, man, that'd be awesome. Go on over to patreon.com slash fostercareuj and join the people helping us over there. That'd be great. We'd love it. That's awesome. If not, the content's always free. Just come on back next week and check it out next week. And be sure to find our social media information. You can find most of that all over at the website or go to Facebook and search for Foster Care and Unparalleled Journey. We have a support group over there, a group of great people. Reach in there, talk to people, ask us questions, and we'll help you out. Again, it's all easy to get into and it's free, no charge, nothing like that. We will talk to you again next week. 
And as always, thanks for listening.